Hi, Vinny. Welcome, Saints. Good morning. And I should not touch that microphone because I've been told by the IT department that things might go blank and then where would we be? We'd, we'd have to do this off the cuff. We could improvise, adapt, and overcome, right? And depend on the Lord. Yes. So the first thing we do, so I'm telling anybody that comes up here for announcements, don't touch the microphone, please. Thank you. All right. Uh, as you can see, the announcements have been scrolling through, and they aren't up at the moment. Uh, does, since they're not up right now, does anybody have any further announcements, Mr. Ben Hock? Come on up. I'm not touching it. Good morning. I have the uh, clipboard for sign up for opportunities at Ushery. <clears throat> and you know how I like to go on. We're either in great shape or we're in bad shape. Well, for the month of December, we are in, or December, January. <laughs> yeah, we're, and, and for January, we are in wonderful shape. Boy, we just couldn't be any better. We've got qualified people just all over the place. But the month of February is looking rather slim, friends, and I know how much you guys like to come to church and worship. So I'm going to just do what we normally do and pass the clipboard, and thanks to everybody who signs up. Thank you, Ben Hawk. Uh, are there any other further announcements? Seeing none, uh, this morning we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming, welcoming John Roethlisberger to the pulpit today. He's the Dean of Lay Ministry at Simpson College. He's been here a couple of times before, give or take, and uh, it's just a pleasure to have you here this morning. Let's all make him feel welcome. <laughs> and with that, we will begin our worship. Let us stand and get ready to sing our opening hymn called The Summons. It is in the black hymnal on page 2130. The words are on the video screen and we will sing verses 1 through 3. Please stand as you are able.
Please remain standing and join with me in the call to worship. I will read the light print and you will read the dark print. As he walked by a lake, Jesus called fishers to follow him. As Jesus journeys through our lives, he asks us to follow him. You may be seated for the prayer of confession. Oh, we're not what? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Stand up. You know us Methodists, we sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up, right? Right, John? Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. As, okay. Am I on the right script now, Rita? Okay. As Jesus wanders in our world, he invites others to join in. Okay, now can we sit down, Steve? No? You may be seated for the prayer of confession. Just so everybody knows, that wasn't in my script up here. That's why I was thrown for a little bit. Okay, let us become before our God in prayer. If we come to God with open hearts and honest words, we will not be pushed away, but wrapped in God's loving and forgiven embrace. I invite you to join me as we confess our lives to God, praying. We admit, God, our light, that we do indeed try to tear Christ apart. A piece of him here to support our politics, a part of him there to undergird our economic views, the rest of him to bolster our fears of others. We could leave immediately to follow him but need to wait until we see where he might lead. We want you to look upon us with favor always, but have no trouble turning our backs on those around us. Hear us, God our Deliverer, as we speak of our failures. Have mercy on us. We appeal to you. Have mercy. Love become the core of our hearts. May your compassion become the words we speak. May your hope illuminate the ways in which we serve others, even as we seek to follow the one who calls us to new life, Jesus the Christ. God is our help, so why should we be afraid? God keeps us safe. There is nothing to dread. This is good news for all of us. Sheltered in God's gracious heart of mercy and love, we raise shouts of joy. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. And now it's time for the children, I believe. And I pass it over to John for that. Let and us all sing where children belong in the black hymnal, page 2233. <laughs> quick scan and I don't believe I see any kids this morning which is not that uncommon in a lot of the churches that I uh, speak in so um, 
I do want to just express, first of all, my joy in being able to join you again. This is my third time to be able to be here. And uh, it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, Pastor Butler comes and uh, provides some instruction at the school for me in the School for Lay Ministry. So uh, I'm always glad when she asks. It's a real compliment to me that she believes I'm okay to come and share with you on a Sunday morning. I was intending, if I had children here, to talk to them about this. And if you saw me arrive this morning, I like to be here about a half an hour ahead, and I was 15 minutes behind on that. And the reason why was all of a sudden I realized, not too many miles down the road, I didn't have it with me. And I had to turn around, run back home, get it, and now, of course, obviously I didn't have to have it, but the intent was to talk to the kids about receiving calls and the messages that we receive on this. And then I was going to add that this morning we're going to study in Scripture a call that some people received and that they didn't have these back then, but what kinds of things would Jesus ask you as children and so we'll just talk about that from the perspective of us as children. Uh, what would God expect us to do? And so I was hoping to lead the conversation toward, um, you know, being kind to mom and dad. And if you have siblings, kind to your siblings. And then your friends and neighbors and those kinds of things. So uh, that was where I was going to take them and then ask them to think in terms of when they hear the, the story this morning that we will read from Scripture, uh, what kind of a call they're talking about in this situation. So anyway, that was the intent for the children's moments. You got it. And now in just a little bit, I'll give you the rest of it. Thank you, John. And now it's time for the reading of the Gospels. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. And today I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 20, or 12 through 23. As we enter this text, we meet Jesus starting to preach and gather disciples. Verse 12 reports that the arrest of John the baptizer is a turning point, a decision, or a hinge point for Jesus. From Luke Chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, we learn that Herod imprisoned John for rebuking Herod because of the evil things he had done. Upon hearing the news, Jesus withdraws to Galilee. The Greek verb for withdraw here is the same verb used to describe Mary and Joseph's flight to Egypt with Jesus. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. These are the words of love for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now we will have our message. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Yes, please be seated. <laughs> um, I did say when I arrived this morning, uh, I think I filled pulpit 
16 times this last summer and then a couple more times during the fall. And I want to compliment your congregation as having probably the most beautifully put together worship experience of all the churches that I've been pleasured to be a part of. So thank you. Uh, you do a nice job of this. Um, and it's a joy to be able to be here. And uh, I will say that your pastor did not ask me to say that. So um, Jesus said, follow me. Each of us can think of times we may have heard those words. It might have been as a child when our parents were concerned about our safety. It might have been from other children when we were doing kid things, some of them good, and just maybe some of them were not so good. <clears throat> we may be able to think of the first time someone introduced us to that call to begin our faith journey. Like our cell phones, we might ignore the call or we might feel the urgency to respond. I won't try to sugarcoat the road I've taken to stand here this morning sharing with you. Growing up with a close tie to the Methodist Church helped me to understand some of our familiar phrases, heart strangely warmed, God's grace, the gift of the sacraments, vital piety, social holiness. The first Bible verse I was required to memorize in confirmation was, as you might guess, back in that day, if you look at my age, the King James Version of John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the King James Version. Okay? That's the one that's up here. I can't help it. I don't use it often, but that one is stuck. And there was the ever very United Methodist understanding of what we call backsliding. I traveled a road that was not very smooth. I knew at an early age that Jesus was an important part of my life, but serving in the military during the Vietnam War pulled me both closer and pushed me further away, depending on what was happening. I came home from the Navy and even questioned the existence of God for a brief time. That was the most dangerous part of my backsliding. But I'm here to tell you that God is faithful, even if I wasn't. Meeting my wife allowed me to hear that call to follow once again. And the United Methodist Church helped me recognize that the pulpit was not my only option. I used my faith and call to serve by working in education, first as a teacher for 16 years, then moving into administration. My faith was always a guiding influence in teaching working in negotiations on both sides of the table, and eventually in providing leadership for school districts. God is alive and well in schools, both in private prayer and how we nurture the young lives we serve. Upon retiring, I felt called to move forward with my desire to serve in our faith community. The School for Lay Ministry helped me consider what that might include, and God kept opening doors. I just had to decide if I would answer that call, or, like we do with our cell phones, ignore it. The real joy in all of that has been helping those of you in the local church work at finding how God is asking you to, as Jesus said, follow me. Christ is always opening doors to ways that we can serve. When we allow Jesus to be in our lives, all things become possible. Now, 
Let's look again at our gospel passage for this morning. It tells us that Jesus knew the very real threat posed by Herod's actions. John the Baptist's arrest created the need for Jesus to flee, as they described in our scripture this morning, to Capernaum and opened the door for the start of Christ's ministry. He began calling his apostles, first Peter and Andrew, followed shortly by the call of James and John. It had been an exciting time for all of them, but an uncertain time for the four new apostles also. We want to keep in mind that although Jesus must have had a very dynamic presence about himself, the group of 12 that would soon be a part of his team never totally got the picture of what was happening until Pentecost. Remember that during the crucifixion, it was only John that stayed with Christ and the women. The rest were in hiding and were even told to go to the upper room until the helper would arrive. When we hear the different calls in our lives, and see the doors open, we need to remember that the road ahead will not always be smooth. Jesus knew that we must leave, or that he must leave his ministry here for several reasons. And that by his leaving, God would give us the help of the Holy Spirit when we encounter those rough spots. All of that was ahead of these four apostles when they heard the call follow me. I don't want to give you the impression that you need a lightning bolt to strike or some major event to happen in your life. For many, it is truly that still, small voice, so easily covered over by the noise of your day-to-day -day lives. Like our cell phones, we might even have them on silent to keep the world at arm's length. The reality is, you are provided so many opportunities in your day-to-day -day living to follow me. As United Methodists, you are very familiar with the words of Matthew 25, then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Those opportunities come in your workplace, in your place of business, and in your everyday interactions with all the people you meet. How do we respond in those simple events of our lives? A wise person once shared with me that the people we meet will give us the opportunity to see God's presence in them. I am not some kind of Pollyanna. I realize some people will not open that window very wide, but in some of my worst situations, looking for the face of Christ in some very unpleasant people has prevented me from causing more hurt in what has obviously been a painful life for them. A kind word, a wave, a smile, helping someone who is physically struggling with something or just holding a door for someone can make a day brighter for everyone, including ourselves. Sometimes we are asked to go further with the least of this world. I have found myself working in one of those areas. If you remember from my other visits with you, I was asked to serve as an interim superintendent of schools at Postville. That renewed my awareness of Iowa justice for our neighbors and led me to accept my duties as your representative from Northeast Iowa on their board. It is very important for me as a person who has always worked to understand the law that I not be part of intentionally doing something that will break the law. Justice for our neighbors specifically looks for those who have the rights under the law, but who for many reasons do not have resources to pay for our very expensive legal system. 
on a needs basis, we, justice for our neighbors, will provide the legal services they qualify to receive. Many of these people are what Christ referred to when he said, least of these. This has brought me to a new point in my life where I am now joining the National Justice for Our Neighbors Board headquartered in Virginia. I'm honored to be the first Iowan to serve in this capacity and am looking forward to God pushing me through new doors. I would like to share with you a short video about this work. Imagine you're a kid who fled Honduras to escape the gangs, and now you don't know what to do or where to go for help. Imagine your husband beats you, but you're afraid to call the police because he says they'll deport you. He threatens to take away your children and tells you there is nothing you can do about it. Imagine you're a teenager and America is the only home you know. You can't work legally and you can't afford to go to college because you are undocumented. Imagine want to fill out the right immigration forms, but you don't know how to do it or even what the right forms are. Imagine you can't go back to your home country because you are afraid the government will kill you, just like they did your brother. Imagine hope. Imagine a church welcoming you and being surrounded by volunteers who care. Imagine finding an attorney you can afford and people you can trust. Each year, Justice for Our Neighbors helps transform the lives of thousands of low-income immigrants from around the world. At offices across the United States, we provide free or low-cost immigration legal services, advocate for immigrant rights, and seek to educate communities of faith and the public. We are Justice for Our Neighbors a ministry of the United Methodist Church. Now I can live here together with family. I don't have to be afraid of the gangs. Now I can ask the police for help and nobody will take my children away from me. I don't have to be a victim anymore. Now I have the chance to go to college, to get a driver's license, to work, and help support my family. Now I know my rights. I won't allow anyone to take advantage of me. Now. I don't have to be afraid of being sent back home to face persecution, torture, or even dead. I am safe. I have dignity. I belong. I am home. I am home. I am home. My prayer for all of us is that through the busyness and noise of our day-to-day -day living, we are able to hear or feel that message coming through from Christ. Follow me. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we know that you are continually working to open our hearts and minds to the needs of the world around us. You strengthen us to act on your behalf through the power of the Holy Spirit to be your hands and feet in serving others. We ask that you make us mindful of the needs of those whose lives we touch so that we may show your loving spirit to all your children. This in all things we ask in your amazing and wonderful name. Amen.